will be led by a combination of our choir and our young people, all of our young people, even though they may not know it yet. <laughs> You have been requested by special powers that be that all young people come forward. And if you're 72, that's okay too. Okay. Our first song tonight as we gather to worship has, is a lifelong favorite of many for many generations. Psalm 23. It's led us through some dark paths and it's led us when we're rejoicing, rejoicing in a Lord that brings us to his home eternally. So as we sing this, we're going to be singing it. There's a descant with it. The women will sing the descant. And so any of you women, try to pitch your voices into and your ear into where the women are singing and join them in singing in the descant. But more as you're singing it, think of those beautiful words that have led us and will lead us through life. Psalm 23. how God's endless mercy follows us. There are many versions of Psalm 23, and we chose this one because it became very well known with our youth at their RYS conventions. And now we're going to put another one to you, I Will Glory in My Redeemer, which they also learned to love at RYS. <laughs>
At Trinity, we love to engage individuals in groups in the joy of singing and joining together in various ways. Tonight, you have before you our young people and those that are representing our choir. In a few weeks, we hope to have a men's and a boys chorus. Now, as you might imagine, all of these things just take a little bit of prep sometimes. And we've already had some little mini rehearsals for this men's and boys chorus, but by request, because we have some Sunday school teachers and those that are in Sunday school haven't been able to come or can't come in the Sunday mornings after church, we are offering one after church tonight. Now, the thing of it is, you have to be, it has to be quick, it has to be punctual, and you have to stay right in here. So, the reason being is we have young peoples tonight, and they serve food, and these young guys want to get to food. So, <laughs> so, those of you that are the Sunday school teachers that haven't had a chance, please just stay right in the sanctuary, don't even go out into the lobby. The young people that are singing, they will stay in. I'm sure that Hudson and Calvin will be leading the troops up here and we'll have a little time so that we can have more singing and whatnot together. As our final song tonight, we'd like to, it's an invitational song of coming to God's presence. And the choir is going to sing it through just one time, a simple little tune, and then we're going to make harmonies by singing in a round. So, uh, we're going to sing it through once, and then congregation, join us singing that first verse, and then we're going to stop. Okay? Here we go. right here over a foot over a foot mr. winters you're supposed to be leading this <laughs> okay this side is going to join mr. winters and his ensemble okay <laughs> what you do is you sing the first line they they are going to go on and sing hallelujah hallelujah but this side is going to start at the very top and we just go on right through one line at a time simple enough right do it because next time we'll break into four. <laughs> and this is like a little prelude to our call to worship. So here we go. be glory to God. Thank you, choir. Thank you, young people, for that beautiful singing and preparing our hearts all the more to praise God tonight. Thank you. As we enter into the Lord's presence, I invite you to stand as we hear these words from Psalm 20 that call us into the presence and praise of God this night. King David writes to your heart and mine, may the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary 
and give you support from Zion. Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with the saving might of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They collapse and fall, but we rise and stand upright. As those who, who, are, who rise and stand upright, would you please join me then in a time of prayer? Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity that you've given to us this night. That we may, together, that we may gather together once again in your house to worship you. And we thank you for the means by which we are able to commune with you through the gift of saving grace in your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, if it were not for this gift of saving faith, we would still express faith. But it would not be faith in your Son. We would put our faith, our hope, our trust in ourselves, our understanding in something or someone else. Such faith would not save us, nor would it provide us with any lasting peace, understanding, or hope. And so we pray that as we gather together this night, that you would, in your grace, perhaps establish saving faith for the very first time in our hearts, or deepen and enrich, and enrich saving faith in our hearts once again, in order that we might look nowhere else other than to you to find our hope and stay. Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit would establish and sustain such faith, that it would be a faith that has your Son as its object, and that we would experience the sweetness of it by communing with you this night. All this we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, together. Amen. Receive the Lord's blessing to your heart as we gather before him as the family of God. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love, and he will exult over you with loud singing. And all God's people said, amen. For our expression of faith this evening, I invite you to take out your blue Psalter hymnal and turn with me to page 17 in the back of the Blue Psalter hymnal. Page 17. It is there on page 17 in the back of the Blue Psalter hymnal that we find ourselves in the Heidelberg Catechism, considering Lord's Day 10. We're going to be looking at questions 27 and 28. And so I will read the question, and may we together with one voice and one heart confess the answer together. And so, Christian, what do you understand by the providence of God? Providence is the almighty and ever-present power of God by which he upholds, as with his hand, heaven and earth and all creatures and so rules them that leaf and blade, rain and drought, fruitful and lean years, food and drink, health and sickness, prosperity and poverty, all things, in fact, come to us, not by chance, but from his fatherly hand. And Christian, how does the knowledge of God's creation and providence help us. We can be patient when things go against us, thankful when things go well, and for the future we can have good confidence in our faith of God and Father that nothing will separate us from his love. All creatures are so completely in his hand that without his will they neither move nor be moved. We have confessed this beautiful truth through these words of the catechism, and now we sing of them as we join our hearts and voices to sing, God moves in a mysterious way.
assured of God's sovereign and providential hand, we bring before him now the praises and pleadings of our heart. Would you please join me in a time of prayer? Gracious Heavenly Father, we are reminded of the last prayer that is recorded for us in all the scriptures. The simple yet profound prayer of the Apostle John from the island of Patmos. The prayer that is recorded for us in the last chapter of the book of Revelation. Come, Lord Jesus. John prayed such a prayer because he was overwhelmed by the beauty and wonder that emanates from the reality that awaits all who call upon the name of your Son. Of being able to dwell with you for all eternity. Of dwelling in a place where there are no more tears and no more death. Of dwelling in the new heavens and the new earth where we will partake of the tree of life as we live eternally in, in the glory of Christ. And as we think of what awaits us, our hearts joyfully are stirred to join with the Apostle John and pray, Come, Lord Jesus. But we confess that this same prayer sometimes fall from, falls from our lips when we are overwhelmed, not by what awaits us in glory, but when we are overwhelmed by what we experience in the present with a sense of fear, of exhaustion and desperation, we sometimes pray, come Lord Jesus, to express our desire to escape the brokenness and depravity that we see welling up from within our own hearts and in what we see running rampant throughout. Father, we know that our prayer asking for the Lord Jesus to come will only be answered at the day and time of your appointing. And so even though we desire to escape the pains and struggles we experience in this world, we also understand that it may not be your will to remove the, us from them just yet. And so instead of praying, come Lord Jesus, as an expression of a desire to escape, may we this night pray, come Lord Jesus, as an invitation asking the Lord Jesus to intervene and work mightily by the power of his Holy Spirit in all of our trials and tragedies, as well as in all our triumphs and joys. And so this night, O oh Lord, we pray, come Lord Jesus, as we consider the situations that John Grzybowski and Arnold Maidendorp are facing as they remain hospitalized. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would come mightily into their hearts and into their lives and into their situations and you will bring healing and recovery to their bodies. Come, Lord Jesus. We pray that you would come mightily into the lives of Tracy Anderson and Dave Johnson and, and Margaret June who have been discharged from the hospital and as they now make life adjustments, Come, Lord Jesus, and work mightily in and through them, we pray. Father, we rejoice and give thanks to you for the way in which you've answered this very prayer for Maureen's brother Robert and his family, who are miraculously and wonderfully able to, to get out of Israel, spared from all the barbarism and terror that that nation is facing right now. And we give thanks to you for your kindness to them. Father, we pray that, that Lord Jesus would come as we consider new life. We join with Kevin and Darla as they welcome two new grandchildren as Ethan and Cherry welcome their firstborn Brixton Jay. And as Austin and Kelsey welcomed Alice Walter. Father, we thank you for these new precious lives that you've given to this dear family. 
We thank you for these two sweet little ones who are made in the image of your son. And we pray, O oh Lord, that in your perfect timing you would draw them unto yourself through your son and by the power of your spirit. We thank you for granting these two children believing parents. And we pray, O oh Lord, that they would humbly see the responsibility laid upon their shoulders. And they would lean upon the church, and they would lean upon family, and they would most importantly lean upon you by pointing their children to Christ. Father, bless these young couples as their families grow. But Father, as we celebrate new life, we also humbly come in the recognition that today is also a day filled with much sorrow for other families. A day of grief stricken as we consider a, a dear little one who was taken far too early from our perspective, yet was welcomed home in your perfect divine timing. Father, we do pray that you would bless the Dykstras as today is Owen's third birth. Father, bless them and strengthen them in this day. And we join with Tim and Julie LaRock as just this past week, this very day, last Sunday, they received the shocking news of Gloria's death. And in this past week, went through the visitation and the funeral. Father, we do pray that you would continue to minister to this dear family in their time of struggle and grief. We're thankful that Gloria knew your son, and more importantly, he knew her as his adopted and beloved daughter. We do pray, O oh Lord, that you would continue to minister to both of these families in their time of grief, and so we pray, come, Lord Jesus. We pray, come Lord Jesus, as we consider our own nation, the nation of Israel and the terrorism that seems to plague the news headlines. We pray for peace, but not for a cheap peace. We pray for the peace that only can come through the gospel of your Son. So come, Lord Jesus. Father, we thank you for the ministries of our church. We thank you for Sunday school and youth group and post high, for the jail ministry and for the choir and other ministries that took place this day. Father, we pray that through them, your word went out and your name was lifted high. Come, Lord Jesus, we pray. But Father, we know that there are many unspoken and unknown prayer needs. And so we pray that you would not only hear our prayers, but you would hear our hearts. Hearts that may groan loudly even when our lips remain silent. Come, Lord Jesus. For, Lord, we long for the day when there will no longer be a need for hospitals and surgeries. When we will no longer receive diagnoses and need treatments and medications. When we'll no longer experience the limitations of the body and mind. We long for the place where there are no more funeral homes and cemeteries. We long for the day when hostility and hatred, when brutality and bloodshed will be a thing of the past as we live together in the one kingdom of Christ. And so we pray once again, come Lord Jesus. Come into our lives. Come into our homes. Work mightily. Come into this world and bring us home. Come, Lord Jesus, that we might be with you in the perfection of eternity and in the beauty of your glory. But until that day, O oh Lord, we thank you for the ways in which we experience but a foretaste of what awaits us in the life to come as we get to praise you, as we get to commune with you, as you are with us 
by faith. Come, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Would you please join me then? As we stand together once again to join our hearts and voices as we sing, My faith looks up to thee. Please join me once again in a time of prayer. Father, we have listened to many voices this past week. We have listened to friends and family. We have likely listened to cable news, talk radio, and podcasts. We have listened to politicians, sports stars, and celebrities. We have heard from a torrent of voices through social media. And we give thanks for whenever those voices have been necessary and helpful for us. And yet, Lord, we need to hear from you. We need to hear from you through your word. We need to listen to your word as it is the only voice that can save and comfort our souls. And so we pray with John the Baptist, may we decrease and may you increase in us. We confess it is easy to listen to a sermon with ears for someone else, but we ask that you would give us ears to listen to what you are saying to our hearts this night. All this we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, together. Amen. If you have your Bibles with you, I invite you to open them with me to the book of Habakkuk, chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. If you're following along in the Pew Bible, that's found on page 997. If you're looking for Habakkuk in your own Bible, you start in the Gospel of Matthew and work backwards. You'll find it after a few small minor prophets. If you've gotten to the book of Nahum, you've gone too far. If you've gotten to the book of Genesis, you've gone way too far. So Lord willing, you can find Habakkuk this night. Habakkuk chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. Hear God's word as it speaks to your heart this night. The oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw. O Lord, how long shall I cry for help, and you will not hear? Or cry out to you violence, and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity? And why do you idly look at wrong? 
destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. And then the Lord responding to Habakkuk's words, we pick up in verse 5. Look among the nations and see. Wonder and be astounded. For I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. They are dreaded and fearsome. Their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards, more fierce than the evening wolves. Their horsemen press proudly on. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle, swift to devour. They all come for violence, all their, face, all their faces forward. They gather captives like sand. At, a king, at kings they scoff, and at rulers they laugh. They laugh at every fortress, for they pile up earth and take it. Then they sweep by like the wind and go on. Guilty men, whose own might is their God. The grass withers and the flowers fade. But the word of our Lord will stand forever. Carl, ba Carl Bart once said that a pastor should preach with the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. Now his intent was not to elevate the authority of the daily newspaper so much as it was to show that what the Bible says is relevant for all cultures, seasons, places, and people. Even though these words from Habakkuk chapter 1 were written over 2,600 years ago and in a place over 6,000 miles away, if we were to hold up this text in one hand and the newspaper headlines in the other, we might be led to believe that Habakkuk 1 was written last week. And the reason for that is because even though cultures and seasons and places may change, the human heart does not, and thankfully, neither does our God. Because of the unfamiliarity that some of us might have with the book of Habakkuk, I, I thought it would be good to begin with a brief historical consideration to get our biblical bearings. King Saul was the first king over Israel. Then David ascended to the throne, and then David's son Solomon became king. And under Solomon's reign, Israel expanded to its greatest size, and the temple that we considered last time was completed. And Israel was a pinnacle of peace and prosperity. The economy was flourishing and, and there was no significant threats from neighboring nations. This was known as the golden age of Israel's history. But we're told in 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 3, that King Solomon took to himself 700 wives and 300 concubines or mistresses many of them who were not Israelites and who worshipped false gods. He allowed them to build temples in Israel to their own gods. And so despite their economic prosperity and national security, their spiritual fidelity was beginning to crumble. And when Solomon died, Israel began to disintegrate all the more as it was split into two separate nations, with Israel to the north and Judah to the south. And it did not take long for Israel's neighboring nations to take notice and want to take advantage of their weaknesses and vulnerabilities. In 722 B.C., the northern kingdom of Israel was overtaken by the Assyrians. And if we were to hit fast forward a little bit in time, we would see that the idolatry of the southern kingdom of Judah was running rampant as King Ammon continued to build temples to false gods while the temple that Solomon built began to fall apart and become dilapidated. When King Ammon died, his son Josiah assumed the throne at age 8. And around the age of 16, Josiah began to lead reforms in Judah. He started by renovating the temple. And as that was going on, the high priest found a, scro a, a scroll of the scriptures. Now bear in mind, they did not have Amazon Prime at the time where you could just order a Bible and have it on your doorstep in two days. 
having a scroll of the scriptures was incredibly rare. In fact, the people had forgotten what God had said. And so Josiah had the scroll read, and, and this led to a brief revival among the people. And during this time, there were three world powers. They were the Assyrians who had overtaken the northern kingdom of Israel, but now they were in decline. They were the Egyptians, but they too were in a time of decline. And then there were the Chaldeans, who are also known as the Babylonians, who were rising to power and were known for their violence and aggression. Now, Necho II was Pharaoh over Egypt. And he had sent a letter to Josiah wanting to march his troops through Judah and into Assyria. But Josiah said no. But Necho II did so anyways. And so Josiah called his army together to fight against the Egyptians. And they met in the valley of Megiddo. Josiah disguised himself as one of the soldiers and fought alongside of his men. And in the battle, Josiah was killed. Josiah's son Jehoahaz immediately assumed the throne, but he would not serve very long as Necho II, when he was making his way back through Judah after battling the Assyrians, took Jehoahaz as his prisoner and placed Josiah's other son, Jehoiakim, on the throne as a puppet king. The reforms that Josiah began ended. And Judah was thrown back into their idolatrous worship. Judah was in a downward spiral economically, nationally, and spiritually. They were in a downward spiral in unbelief, immorality, and lawlessness. And the one glimmer of hope that they had in Josiah was now gone. Roughly 20 years after Habakkuk wrote these words, Judah, the southern kingdom, would be overtaken by the Chaldeans, by the Babylonians in 586 B.C. And in that time, the temple was completely destroyed. The city of Jerusalem was ransacked and burned, and God's people were taken into captivity. But back in 607 B.C., when Habakkuk first penned these words, he was looking across the landscape of his country and his people, and he didn't recognize them anymore. And his heart grew weary and heavy. And as you and I look across the landscape around us and we see our culture, we too perhaps see a downward spiral that manifests itself in unbelief and immorality and lawlessness. And perhaps you and I make a similar assessment that we don't recognize things anymore. And our hearts also grow weary and heavy as well. Though our circumstances may be very different, the human heart and the human condition are universal. The heaviness that Habakkuk felt because of the devastation he saw expressed itself in frustration, as we read in verses 1 through 4, where he spoke of the silence of God. We read the oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw, And that word oracle can be translated as the burden or the affliction. You see, this this letter is the burden, it's the affliction that that Habakkuk the prophet saw. And then we hear Habakkuk's words, O Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? Or cry to you violent and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity? And why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. There was violence, iniquity, crime, immorality, injustice, destruction. There was strife, contention, and disputes. And the world seemed like it was filled with chaos and absent of security. It seemed like the wicked were the ones who were pulling the strings and levers of power. Now Habakkuk was not surprised by the depravity of humanity. But he was surprised by what seemed to be a lack of restraint and presumed silence on the part of God. 
And so he brought his frustrations and his questions before the Lord. Is that the posture that you and I take? When you and I are frustrated and overwhelmed? When we turn off our televisions, when we put down our phones, after we've read through the the list of news headlines, are we quick to turn to the Lord in prayer and bring those concerns to him? Is that our initial response to trouble, to bring it to the Lord, or is it to grumble about it to others? Now, Habakkuk was not grumbling, but he was groaning. And there is a difference between the two. Grumbling is expressing our frustration when we don't get what we want. Groaning is expressing our frustrations when we see injustice and evil against what God wants. Habakkuk pointed out the terrible things that were going on that God didn't seem to stop. He wondered why God would allow him to see such terrible things. And if God allowed him to see them, then surely God saw them too. And if God saw them, then why didn't he respond and stop them? If a broken sinner like Habakkuk could groan over injustice and evil, then surely it should invoke a holy and just God to respond in some way. It almost seemed cruel to allow Habakkuk to be exposed to and see such terrible and evil things happening and not allow him to see the wrongs being righted and the evil being extinguished. Habakkuk even went as far as to say the law is paralyzed and justice never goes forth. In other words, the law is impotent. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't restrain the people from their evil because there's no consequences for their actions. Because, as Habakkuk notices, justice never goes forth. And not only that, but because the wicked are now aware of their unrestrained freedom, they freely attack the righteous. And because the wicked hold positions of power, they now use the law against the righteous. And so justice goes forth perverted. And that it's not just used to restrain the wicked, it's now used to persecute the righteous. And is that not what we see in our own day and age as well? As we look across the landscape of the culture today, can we relate to Habakkuk's heart? There was a 19-year-old young man named Shig Ho who was living in Syria. And he was murdered by Islamic militants when they came to his town. He had converted from Islam to Christianity, and when the militants became aware of him, they executed him for his apostasy to Islam. There was a young girl named Monica who was living in Nigeria. And back in 2014, there were 276 girls who were kidnapped by the Islamic terrorist group known as Boko Haram. Many of the young girls were forcibly converted to Islam and forced to marry the militants. But Monica was a Christian. Her father was a pastor. And she refused to convert. And in response, the Islamic terrorists dug a hole, buried her up to her neck, and then proceeded to stone her to death. Or consider what happened in 2020 in Moscow. That's Moscow, Idaho, where Christians had gathered to protest against the stringent orders, the stringent executive orders placed on them by their mayor. They peacefully protested by having a public hymn sing, and three congregants were arrested. Or consider the atrocities to humanity that have plagued our news recently with all that's going on in Israel. I will spare you the details of the stories that have come out of Israel in this recent week. But be assured, they are barbaric. They are cruel. And they are demonic. And we could go on and on. There's there's many stories of injustice and perverted justice, of violence and wickedness and discord. And like Habakkuk, we might find ourselves asking, God, where are you? What are you doing? Why do you seem silent? 
Shouldn't you be doing this? Here, just do these three things. Please just do something. It seems so obvious. It seems so clear. This seems to be the right thing, the moral thing, the just thing. Just please do something because you seem to be silent. It's hard to imagine stronger human emotions other than perhaps grief that strike us so strongly as a sense of injustice and a sense of helplessness. Because we're all made in the image of a just God, there is something innate in every human heart, believer and unbeliever alike, that cries out for justice, even if we have different definitions of justice, and even if we don't attribute or acknowledge being made in the image of God as the reason why we make such a demand. When you and I see and experience injustice, we feel unsure, uncertain, insecure, and helpless. And as a result, we become fearful and afraid, and we often express them in anger or anxiety. How many of us tonight is that a description of what's been going on in your heart? Not just because of what you see in the world, but because of what you experience in your home. Even though Habakkuk had accused God of being silent, we read on and we hear the Lord's response. And he tells us that the problem was not in the silence of God, but in the deafness of mankind. Picking up in verse 5, the speaker changes. And God says, look among the nations and see, wonder, and be astounded. For I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. The pronouns are now in the plural, meaning that God is not just responding to Habakkuk individual, but individually, but he is addressing all of Israel. And God tells them to look, to see, to be in wonder and be astounded. God is essentially saying the problem is not that I'm not hearing you. It's that you're not hearing me. I'm speaking, I'm screaming, I'm doing all sorts of things. And it may not be what you want to hear. And it may not be what you expect. And it may not be what you want. But do not be mistaken. I am not silent. God is reorienting them to his sovereignty, to his omnipotence, meaning his being all-powerful, to his being the Lord, and not only over the land of Israel, but the king over all creation. And what does God then say in verse 6? Behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation who march through the breadth of the earth. The Chaldeans were not rising up by their own ability as if they were outside the sovereign plan of God and that he somehow needed to respond to them. Their rising up to become a superpower was all part of God's plan, still under his sovereign control. And then in verses 7 through 10, God speaks of their military prowess and cruelty and might. And as we hear that, it's jarring to our souls, and we might be confused and compelled to ask, does this make God the author of sin? Does this mean that, that God was, is that what it means when we read that God was raising up the Chaldeans? What we must understand is that God raising them up was not God inciting them as though he was whispering in their ear, you see my people over there go and make life miserable for them. No, God's raising them up was manifested in his loosening of his common grace restraints that would have otherwise prevented them from doing what their depraved hearts truly desired. God had protected his people by holding back the depravity and wickedness of others. God's loosening his restraining grip was a judgment on the people of Judah. So what was God's indictment against his people? He had set them apart from the world, and yet they wanted to be just like the world. He was their king, but they wanted a king like all the other nations. They had worshipped false gods, 
when the one true living God dwelled among them in the temple. And so God was essentially saying, if, if you want to abandon me, and you want to be like this fallen world and worship false gods, well, then I'm going to give you exactly what you want. And you will experience what life is like without my protection and provision. And you will experience what life is like with my hand removed. Do not think that the happenings all around us are but random chaos when they very well may be the birth pains of discipline. It, shouldn't, it should be a surprise to no one that when there is an abandonment of God, a culture then acts godless. When we read that God raised up the Chaldeans, it's not as though he made them evil. He simply pulled back the restraint on their evil as a judgment on Judah, as a means to give them what they believed they truly wanted. You see, they were trusting in chariots. They were trusting in horses. But they were not trusting in the name of the Lord. But what they thought they wanted was to live just like the rest of the world. And it was living just like the rest of the world that would lead to their demise, deportation to Babylon, destruction, and death. For Judah, their slippery slope into idolatry became more than they could ever imagine. Their subtle walking away from the Lord would prove to be more significant than they ever thought. Their abuse of God's grace and patience would prove to be a grave mistake. And then we read in verse 11. Then they sweep by like the wind and go on, guilty men whose own might is their God. It speaks to the indictment against the people of Judah, does it not? That God would use this arrogant, wicked, and pagan people whose might is their own God to be the instrument that he would use to discipline his people. From Habakkuk's immediate perspective, it seemed as though God was silent and was doing nothing. But from God's eternal perspective, he was not inactive, impotent, or indifferent. He was working mightily among the nations and in his perfect timing would respond to Judah's idolatry, injustices, and evil in ways that even Habakkuk would never have thought of. In his commentary on Habakkuk, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones wrote, this shows us that when God does answer, what he says is more mysterious than his apparent failure to listen to our prayers. We all tend to, in our own prayers, to project how we think God will answer or how we want him to answer. But sometimes he doesn't follow our script. We wouldn't think that the pagan Babylonians, with all their cruelty and arrogance, as a tool in God's toolbox. So how are we to read our text in light of what we read in the newspaper? Well, first, we must be very careful not to become like Job's friends and attempt to say definitively that this means that or that there is a one-to-one -one parallel between what we read happening in Judah and what we read in today's paper. We understand the United States is not the new Israel. It is not the new promised land. The nation of Israel was in a unique covenantal relationship with God. And there is no geopolitical nation this day that is in a similar covenant relationship. God's covenant is not with a country, but with his church. And so when we, like Habakkuk, look across the landscape of our culture today, and we find our voice echoing Habakkuk's prayers and pleadings, we are to heed the, the words of God in verse 5, look among the nations and see. Wonder and be astounded, for I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if you were told. Do you realize that God is working right now? He is not overwhelmed or caught off guard by anything that is happening. Whether it be more broadly when we look across the world, but also when we look more personally, 
into your own home. He doesn't wake up to read the headlines to consider what he may have missed while he was asleep. Every nation on earth is under the hand of God. And there is no power in this world that pulls on the hand of God. And so we must also recognize that history then follows a divine plan. The events of history are not accidental, though they may appear so from our perspective at times. Everything follows God's sovereign plan. We confessed it earlier in the Heidelberg Catechism, did we not? We like to confess this when we're speaking of, of rain and fruitful years, of health and prosperity, but we must also understand this also applies during the drought and lean years and the sickness and poverty as well. Everything follows God's sovereign plan. And human efforts can never force the hand or thwart the plan of God. So forth, we must recognize that history is bound up, bound up with his divine kingdom. The center of all history is the kingdom of God with Christ as its king. The stories of nations mentioned in the Old and New Testaments, the empires, kingdoms, and nations that rise and fall throughout human history are relevant only as far as they bear upon the history of the Christian church. If the church is Christ's body, if the church is Christ's bride and belongs to him, and Christ is king over all creation, then it would stand to reason that everything that happens, happens in relation to the church. What really matters in the world today is God's kingdom, Christ's church, even if the rest of the world is blind to that reality. And so what we read in the news headlines must be considered through those lenses. I close with these words from James Montgomery Boyce. Let us not therefore be stumbled when we see surprising things happening in our world. Rather, let us ask, what is the relevance of this event to the kingdom of God? Or if strange things are happening to you personally, do not complain. But ask, what is God teaching me through this? What is there in me that needs to be perhaps corrected? What is God showing me about himself? There is meaning in them if we only can see it. And we can only see it if we seek the kingdom of God first and seek it his, through his will and his word. We need not become bewildered. We need not become anxious and doubt the love or the justice of God. God is concerned about us and intends to fit us for a fuller place in his everlasting kingdom. We should therefore judge every event in light of God's great, eternal, and glorious purpose. Let us pray. Father, we confess that we are prone to become overwhelmed. But it's not always the right things that overwhelm us. We are often overwhelmed by the happenings in your creation rather than overwhelmed by the glory, majesty, and sovereignty of its creator. We far too easily can grow anxious and angry over the happenings that are outside of our control. And we forget that they are not outside of yours. The world attempts to relegate the church to the peripheral and deems us unimportant and non-essential. And we can easily adopt a similar posture of heart. And so we pray that in your grace, that you would, not, you would not allow us to see, not only see all that is going on, but that you would also pull back the veil and allow us to see your hands sovereignly working and moving all things for the good of your church and for the glory of your name. And Father, when we cannot trace your hand, may we nevertheless be able to trace your heart. All this we ask for Jesus' sake and in Jesus' name.
please join me then as we stand together to join our hearts and voices as we sing, If You But Trust in God to Guide You. Receive the Lord's blessing as we depart this night as a family of God. May the good shepherd who laid down his own life for his sheep continue to be your faithful shepherd who defends you from all evils, who delivers you from all your fears, who protects you from all your own folly and will carry you home to himself with all peace and rejoicing. And all God's people said,